<laughs> it's an Archeo Death publication launch. I think probably we have everyone that is going to arrive thus far and welcome everyone to our Department of History and Archaeology research seminar series and today's research seminar which is a joyous occasion because it is a book launch and a book launch that's very uh, near and dear to the department's heart. My name is Megan Gondek, I'm uh, one of the archaeologists here at uh, Chester and I think Di and I might have started in the same year. I think we both kind of started in 2006. So uh, he was a wonderful colleague to uh, start with as an honorary professor here at uh, the university when we were still finding our way as a department of archaeology. And I remember very fruitful and long discussions over coffees and uh, lunches in various cafes around Chester <laughs> when I began and the occasional pint or three uh, as well <laughs> after a teaching session. And I suppose one of my most favorite memories of Dai is uh, he was teaching our sort of contemporary archeology span course where he would often talk about his experiences in public inquiries and the students really benefited from this, but he also really liked to kind of wind them up and do things unexpected. So he got them all to go out into the yard in front of the blue coat and made them all do some dowsing for water in front of the blue coat, <laughs> which was a very strange sight to see, uh, especially since at least one, and it's Sam may have been one of them, at least one of the students was in full Civil War dress regalia. Yes, it was Sam. So there was wonderful image of Di, who was always very smartly dressed in, a, in his uh, Chester tie, uh, leading this sort of dowsing experience in front of the blue coat as everyone was passing by and Japanese tourists and Sam dressed in full, full Civil War gear as well. So that, that certainly sticks in my memory. So today we're here to celebrate um, uh, a project that aimed to bring together Dai's work. And this is uh, edited by three of um, our speakers here tonight, well, our introductory speakers here tonight. So we have Howard Williams and Cara Critchell, and of course, Sheena Evans as well as our editors. And I'm really going to hand over first to Howard and Sheena, I think maybe, to say a few words about the volume. Thank you so much, Megan, and hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, this volume has uh, pulled together um, many, not all, of Dai's uh, contributions to archaeology, his publications uh, spanning uh, a whole series of sections of his career and ideas, uh, his work on early medieval archaeology, on uh, ancient monuments and their conservation, on the history of antiquarianism and early archaeology and the um, early modern church in Wales. And so that might seem like an eclectic collection, but actually it, it looking at it finally in physical form and uh, holding it. And there it is for everyone to see. This is the volume we're talking about. Um, Archaeologies and Antiquaries Essays by Di Morgan Evans. It really um, republishing his works which appeared in various edited collections and journals over the years in a new collection are painstakingly reformatted by Cara, um, final edit by myself with Sheena's expert help. We've we've pulled together something I think is really quite distinctive and it flows in ways we didn't expect and uh, actually concludes in a really touching way with a uh, anecdote about a um, un otherwise unrecorded uh, 18th century antiquary within a, uh, a a small parish in North Wales, and but it's it's so it's it's a volume that sort of takes you on a journey of not only celebrating Dye's many careers in archaeology, his many successive roles in in uh, English and Welsh archaeology, um, but it also takes you on a journey from many different ways we can look at the the story of the archaeology of this island and it's uh, how past generations of scholars have tried to grapple with the very fragmentary evidence that we have for um, that story. And so I, I'm, I'm very proud, proud and pleased of the volume um, and thank, uh, there's all the thanks I really have done in the introduction. I, my my co-authors of the introduction uh, were called Di Morgan Evans, A Life in Archaeology, Chris Must, Chris Must and Christopher Young, Rosemary Cramp, Adrian James and uh, Sheena, of course, and uh, also um, the, the many societies and organisations that gave permission for the reproduction of chapters, the reformatting, and also the various organisations 
that gave permission for additional images to be included, including, for example, Clue of Paris Archaeological Trust gave permission for images and uh, also um, his estate as well. And uh, so many sort of additional visualizations of, of, of thy story and of the sites and uh, topics that he addresses through his publications. Um, I'm probably going to forget all the other thanks I need to make other than to say Archaeopress have done a really fantastic job in pulling this together. I'm, I, I'm, I've been working on a series of other projects with Archaeopress as, an, as having to do with all the work as part of their Access Archaeology series. I haven't done a book like this before with them and uh, they've done they've done us proud, I think, with the production, which is, I think, for, you know, being uh, an archaeologist publishing over the last 20 five years uh, i've seen many different styles of publication to put it uh, diplomatically and I, I have to say this is one of the most you know well probably the most satisfactory and um professional jobs i've seen um and, and i'm very pleased with it so i hope that those watching this video can uh, get get themselves a copy of it or uh, and and uh, and i think it's going to be of, of lasting influence and interest to people interested in the history of archaeology and the various specific archaeological topics that die address through his work i mean that's really all i wanted to uh, say by way of introduction and uh, um to, to thank all for my, my co-editors who worked so hard on this this project over the years through covid and out <laughs> um um and uh, we've we finally got this as a as to, to to remember die and to also to as a as a as recognition of his work and life but also to to recognize the many topics that i think are still we're still struggling to understand about how we explore the the history of this island, the history of uh, antiquarian and archaeological study, but also the heritage aspect, which we're going to hear about tonight as well, about how um, Dai contributed through his career to public understanding of that story. So that, that's that's all I wanted to really say. I don't know if Sheena, you wanted to add anything at all? <laughs> well, just briefly, because I'm, I'm very much the junior um, editing partner in this. Um, but uh, I, it is uh, quite a thrill to see this book. Um, and I know that Di would have been quite thrilled. And now I'm going to do a Di and sort of get a bit choked. Um, <laughs> but uh, he really he really loved coming up to Chester and he, he loved his colleagues here. And of course, he, he so much enjoyed teaching. Um, but he would love to see this. And it's been a pleasure to me uh, to be involved because it it reminded me I you know I used to get to read through these articles and even make suggestions occasionally. Sangar is the one that really sticks in my mind because it was so detailed, and uh, you know such a, a jigsaw puzzle to put together. Um, uh, and I'm terribly grateful to Howard and Cara for the way they've um, worked on this and driven it through. So I think that's. All I'd like to say. Oh, thank you, Sheena. Uh, Cara, did you want to add anything, or are you? <laughs> no, just just to say um, that obviously, as a modern historian, this isn't really something I ever imagined being involved in. Um, so it was this, you know, going through sort of archaeological um, texts. But it's interesting hearing Sheena that the thing that you know, because obviously, various people in the department have seen me over time where I was scanning in and formatting, and um, but Klangar Church, those. The, the detail in that it sticks in my mind as well. That those are the chapters that really stick in my mind. And um, so it was interesting that it also also the ones that stuck in Sheena's as well. But no, just to say it was a it was a pleasure um, to work on this book with with Howard and Sheena. And I'm just so happy and proud that it's it's out and it's it's published. So thank you for the opportunity to have me involved in that. Thank you so much to all of our editors and congratulations again uh, to you on the production of this beautiful volume, which I hope that people will read and enjoy. So now we're going to turn to the, the main event, I suppose, in today's uh, research seminar. We've got two papers for you today of people who um, have, have, have worked and knew die and hopefully no one will get too choked up, I hope, especially not me. Um, so our pr first paper is by um, Professor Nancy Edwards, who I'm very pleased to uh, welcome to the research seminar series. Nancy is now only just recently really Emeritus Professor of Medieval Archaeology at Bangor 
Um, but I imagine she's even as more busy than she was before she retired. <laughs> and Nancy is certainly one of the most kind of um, significant contributors to early medieval archaeology uh, in, in Britain, particularly with um, Welsh archaeology, especially spearheading the magnificent corpus of uh, early medieval Welsh sculpture that has recently emerged in three beautiful volumes. Tonight, she's going to be focusing on uh, one of the projects, a collaborative project that she worked on with Di. And hopefully she's going to be able to share her screen shortly and give us her uh, paper, Digging with Di, Excavations at the Pillar of a Lease Egg. Nancy? Um, I'm now going to sh uh, share my screen, so hopefully it will work. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. Come on. Yes, we can see. Yeah, that's fine. Good. Um, so um, I just need to go back one. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, digging with dye excavations at the Pillar of Eliseg. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to um, return to this project. I've recently finished a book on life in early medieval Wales, which will be coming out next year. And this is one of the major projects that I need now to focus on and to bring to publication. Now, this project, Project Eliseg, um, which Di Morgan Evans was very actively involved in in 2010, was um, a three year project between 2010 and 2012 and it involved um, myself I suppose as the PI and um, Gary Robinson of um, uh, Bangor University as one of the CIs and Howard Williams as the other CI and this was um, uh, involved um, a large number of students for over the three seasons of excavation from both Bangor and Chester universities. And you can see some of these students with dye um, on, on the slide. And you can see also the variety of, um, uh, uh, of, pub, of um, sponsors for this excavation. Now, um, the aims of the excavation um, were tied to the conservation of the monument. And um, what essentially we were trying to do overall was to um, understand better the archaeology of the cairn, which we were excavating. And we also wanted to understand the landscape context of the monument. And ultimately, we were reconstructing the monument biography from uh, essentially the early Bronze Age up to the present day. And an important part of the excavation was explaining the monument to the public. And I'll come to that right at the very end. So essentially, what is the Pillar of Eliseg? Well, it's an incomplete now because the crosshead's been lost. You saw the reconstruction on the previous um, picture at the beginning of an earlier ninth century round shafted cross standing on top of an early Bronze Age cairn um, at a site in the valley of the Nantagrusig um, near Llangollen. And what I'm going to do now is to show you some of the um, highlights of the excavation and also um, of the reconstruction of the um, biography of the Pillar of Eliseg. So, we uncovered, um, and this was very much aligned to the conservation of the monument, which was in rather a bad way, um, including a large tree growing out of the side of it. Um, and you can see here the three trenches that we opened um, in uh, the first year. And we most of the, after the first year, most things were concentrated in these two trenches. And we were, investigating um, an early Bronze Age um, 
platform cairn and the radiocarbon dates, which you can see here, indicate it's of early Bronze Age date. And it turned out to be more complex as an early Bronze Age monument than hitherto had been understood before the excavation. You can see here the curved cairn, um, and then you can see that at a later point, the cairn was raised from a kind of platform to a much higher monument. And we investigated three kists, early Bronze Age kists, as part of this. Um, the first kist, kist one, had been um, disturbed in by antiquarians later on, and I'll talk about this a bit later. Um, and uh, you can see there was enough cremated bone to get an early Bronze Age date from it. The third kist, which I'll talk about in a minute, was in the edge behind the curb of the cairn. And you can see here um, early Bronze Age dates. And then there was a second kist, which was in a later phase, higher up the uh, mound of the cairn. And we didn't get a, a proper date from this. There wasn't enough surviving. But by far the most interesting of these was kist three behind the curb. And this has turned out to be the largest kist, early Bronze Age kist um, excavated in Wales and um, from the point of view of the amount of cremated bone. And um, this has allowed a study, uh, you can see the way it was excavated here. And we now know that there were um, six individuals buried in within this grave, at least um, three, six, in two different tranches. And the bodies were probably cremated and then the ashes put in bags. And you can see, one of the pins of the bags, um, here the bone pins, and um, also you can see a flint knife that was also part of the grave. So the Bronze Age monument, if you like, was an essential backdrop to what is happening in the early medieval period. Because in this early medieval period, we get, as Howard Williams has shown amongst others, the extensive reuse of an earlier um, prehistoric monuments and prehistoric landscapes in order to reinvent them for in new ways. And essentially what we're seeing in the early ninth century is the reinvention of that prehistoric landscape and the prehistoric monument as a landscape of assembly. I don't have time to talk about this in um, great detail, but essential to our um, recognition that this was um, a landscape of assembly, a, a royal site, and possibly a site of royal inauguration of the rulers of Powys at that time, is the inscription on the Pillar of Elisek. Because essentially the pillar of Eliseg has lost its crosshead, but the inscription, which is now illegible, was legible in the late 17th century when it was recorded by Edward Lloyd in 1696. And this is one of the two transcripts that have survived of that inscription. And basically, the inscription tells us a lot about the monument and the context in which it was um, probably erected. Because essentially the monument was erected by Konken, the last early medieval ruler of Powys who died in 854 in Rome. And it was dead, uh, in memory of his great grandfather Eliseg. So that's how the inscription begins. It records the military success of Eliseg over the English in the late 8th century, in the time of Offa. And through the next part of the inscription is more difficult to read, but it may trace the origins of the kingdom of Powys back to the Roman usurper Magnus Maximus, who died in 388. And it also appears to mention the sub-Roman ruler Vortigern. We can also see links between church and state through mention of 
St Germanus, or um, his Welsh form of his name, Garmon. The lettering, even in Edward Lloyd's transcription, we can see is decorative and the forms are consciously antiquated and this adds weight to the significance of the inscription. Essentially, the inscription um, is a piece of royal um, propaganda. It was intended to be um, uh, read out loud, if you like, or uh, recited. It, the document um, of the inscription is in legal language. We have this word chirographum, and it's similar to that found on what are often described as Celtic charters. And we know that it was written by a man called Conmach. The language also suggests that the inscription should be both proclaimed out loud, recitavarit, and it's all part of establishing the origins uh, of the kingdom of Powys and also the idea that it will um, persist forever, even though this did not happen. And um, when you link that with the landscape context and some other comparisons um, uh, beyond uh, Wales, for example, um, we can see that the most likely use of this site was as an assembly and perhaps royal inauguration landscape of the rulers of Powys. So what, what happens afterwards? What's the next stage in the biography of the pillar of Eliseg? Well, essentially it was still a cross in the late medieval period and it was reinvented as part of the monastic landscape of um, the Cistercian Abbey of Valle Crucis. And we can see um, in this uh, picture, we can see Valle Crucis, um, which, and we can see where the Pillar of Eliseg is in relationship to it. And also we can see Castelldina Spran, which may have been an important early medieval royal site. It certainly was an important royal site in the later Middle Ages. And um, Valle Crucis Abbey was founded in 1201 by Prince Madoc at Griffith Maelor, who was the ruler of Northern Powys. So it's essentially re-establishing a monument patronized by the rulers of Powys um, some 250, 300, sorry, 300 years after the original, um, the uh, 350 years, after the original use, early medieval use of the monument as a royal assembly land, uh, a royal assembly landscape, it's still on land owned by the rulers of Powys. So at the end of the Middle Ages, um, <clears throat> of course, we get the Reformation. And I've done quite a lot of research to suggest that the monument uh, the uh, monument as we see it now, um, it was had the crosshead um, chopped off, so to speak, and the monument was thrown down, um, almost certainly in the early 1640s. And at this point, um, the uh, Cromwell's army was in this part of North Wales, and it seems to be at this moment that it was probably thrown down. Now, um, in a sense, the throwing down of the monument brought attention back to it because uh, Edward Lloyd um, comes to, re uh, as well as Robert Vaughan, come to record the inscription on the, st on the stone, um, on the pillar. And, but we can see the real uh, reinvention of the monument in the latter half of, or latter quarter really, our last quarter of the 18th century. And the background to that is the rise of Celticism, a new um, interest in Celtic languages and cultures, and the rise of the Gothic and the picturesque. And I can't talk about this in detail, but essentially one of the major drivers of this was a poem which was written by Thomas Gray called The Bard, and this was published in 1757. 
And this um, uh, inspired the wonderful picture, which you can see by Thomas Jones of the bard that was produced in 1774. At the same time, Thomas Gray was a friend of Horace Walpole, who produced the first Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto, in 1764. And all this brought North Wales back into the consciousness of um, intellectuals and travellers. And what happens at the Pillar of Eliseg is, um, if you like, a product of that renewed interest that I've just mentioned. Because in the 1770s, the monument is reinvented. And what we can see here is that um, a drawing by Thomas Pennant's drafts person and servant, um, Moses Griffiths, which took place showing the um, monument sort of imagined as being erected around, re-erected about 1779. And um, Thomas Pennant, who of course was a famous uh, travel writer and uh, natural, his uh, natural historian, um, he lived not terribly far from the Pillar of Eliseg and he was responsible for recording the fact that an excavation of this monument happened in the 1770s, and I'll come to that in a minute. And he also brought the monument uh, to the attention of Daines Barrington, um, who introduced this rather fanciful um, uh, 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 reconstruction, also probably by Moses Griffiths, um, to the Society of Antiquaries. And I thought I'd mention this because of Dye's uh, long association with the Society of Antiquaries um, in uh, May 1773. And you can see that Pennant tells us within these last few years, the tumulus was opened and the relics of certain bones found there placed as usual between some flat stones. So basically he's describing an early Bronze Age kist. So um, let's just look at the excavation. The excavation, um, uh, the antiquarian excavation was carried out at the behest of Trevor Lloyd, who was the owner, the landowner at that time, and you can see a picture of um, his uh, of him by William Parry. And William Parry's uh, brother was indeed a friend of Thomas Gray. So you can see the kind of uh, circles in which we're working in this period. Now, in this, you can see the the trench, and you can see that the area of the antiquarian disturbance um, with the cairn, um, it, with, with the little kist is just here, um, uh, basically they dug a large um, uh, uh, hole and um, disturbed the, the cairn quite extensively. And we have this these bits of pottery and clay pipe fragments in from the intrusion in order to prove what they were doing. And um, uh, then uh, what happened was that Trevor uh, uh, Lloyd um, uh, re-erected the cross on its little sort of platform there. And he records in Latin, which is quite common in this period um, for uh, inscriptions on monuments, that which remains of this old monument, long removed from eyes and neglected, T. Lloyd of Trevor Hall, finally restored AD 1779. So basically, a few years after the excavation, he had the monument um, re-erected. Now, um, Di Morgan Evans um, was the, pointed out to me um, that you could see um, the monument very clearly from the summer house, which was also um, erected by Trevor Lloyd in 1773 just at, within the grounds of Valley Crucius Abbey. And from that, you could have a vista towards the Pillar of Eliseg. And the idea was that visitors would come to these various monuments in the Vale of Llangollen um, as part of this romantic, picturesque landscape, and they would visit the Pillar of Eliseg. And there are a lot of travellers' tales recorded to do with the Pillar of Eliseg. But I just can only summarize it now 
by looking at this drawing by the artist Thomas, Thomas Rowlandson in 1797, which shows tourists being lectured, if you like, um, at the monument and its state at that time. So um, what I've tried to do today is to um, draw your attention to the significance of this monument. And of course, um, and it's complicated biography. I've only showed you some instances. There are a lot of other interesting reinventions and reuses as well in the period of the 19th century. But a central part of this um, excavation was community and online engagement. And um, just a few pictures to remind perhaps Howard who led this of um, our engagement with uh, the community of Flangotland on open days and um, the importance of uh, members of the Kumud uh, Yal uh, Viking Age react reenactment group who came in the first year and also in the second year of uh, Howard's daily vlogs, which are still available on um, YouTube and um, of the importance of that, in a sense, of leading the way in vlogging uh, um, and archaeology at that time. So basically, um, I think this was an extremely important uh, archaeological project. I'm very much looking forward to um, getting to grips with it again in the next, um, in not very distant future. And um, I think that it's important to think about um, how, perhaps how Dai's uh, role in the early days of this excavation. And indeed, he was an excellent cook in the first year of the excavation. And um, we'll be remembering him um, through this new volume as well. Thank you, Thank you very much. Nancy for that presentation. Now we are going to be able to allow to have questions and comments uh, at the end of the session, but we're going to be moving on to our next paper now. So please do write those questions down for Nancy or comments down for Nancy at the end of our session today. And I'd like to, to now turn to our second speaker of the uh, afternoon, late evening, late afternoon. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Roger White, who's an honorary senior lecturer in archaeology at the University of Birmingham currently. Um, Roger has had um, uh, so much experience, it's hard to summarise, but he has extensively worked on the extremely complicated and uh, a very large site at Roman Rockster and its hinterlands. And he's brought that amazing evidence to publication and has made it available and uh, managed to uh, consider the, the implications of that site as a heritage site. And he's also worked um, as a leading figure in historic environment planning uh, across, not just in England, but across uh, Europe, his expertise is in, in high demand. So in today's session, he's going to return to Roman Roxeter um, for us uh, and give us his talk on building on the past lessons learned from the reconstruction of a villa urbana at Roxeter Roman city in Shropshire. So Roger over to you. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you yes, fine. Can. Good, okay. Um, the, uh, the opportunity to get involved in this came directly from Roger, I think we've hit mute accidentally. I have. Yes, thank you. There thank we go. We lost you for a bit. Yeah. Um, he uh, he contacted me probably 2009 to to uh, to uh, invite me to get involved in this. Uh, it's worth saying that I I kept myself very much in the background, but I did visit on an extremely regular basis. So I was there hovering around uh, and avoiding the cameras like mad. But <laughs> um, here he is um, uh, uh, celebrating the opening of the villa officially and formally on the on the 16th of February. And of course, the illustration on the front of the book shows the doorway to the villa with his initials. Um, uh, 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 so every time you visit the villa, you are reminded of him. We've just lost sound again. Sorry, Roger. It's because I'm pressing the wrong button to advance. Oh. Hang on. 
That's all right. Right now. Yeah. OK, so basically the plan was, uh, as Dyer told me, was to rebuild or to do a, a version of building six. They didn't have enough of a budget to to reconstruct the whole building. Building six is is a, um, a, 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 a townhouse that was excavated. The largest of the townhouses is excavated in 1913-14 by uh, Bush Fox, south of the um, on the other side of the road from the bars at Roxter and heading toward the village. And uh, and as you can see, it's quite a complex building. It includes a small bathhouse. And originally, the plan was to have a the bathhouse separate from the the house at Roxeter as recreated, but then they decided to combine it. So the the two illustrations you see here of the Villa Urbana, the plan and the the elevations, show it with this with this combined bathhouse. But that wasn't the original intention. So the idea was just to give an idea of what of what townhouses looked like in Roxeter at that time at that time. Um, the site chosen, they were originally going to build it on the other side of the road, but it was then moved to the um, uh, to, to the forum side uh, adjacent to the cottage. Um, uh, at an early stage, it was just um, basically the whole reason the site was chosen was to have the old work in the background. That was the that was the only reason for locating it where it was. They wanted to have the old work in the background. Um, paradoxically, they never talked about rocks at all in the program. It was a slightly strange uh, thing, but I'll come back to this in, uh, at a later date. So there it is on that site, re, 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 um, sort of appearing out of the ground. And that's the Alan Sorrell reconstruction of Site 6, um, or uh, all of the buildings that Bush Fox excavated, including a temple. But the one nearest the camera uh, is site six and in effect what you're seeing is a realization of it. So the important point about this is that um, uh, is that this is all about television. This is a television program and that determined exactly how the reconstruction would happen because the whole thing had to be compressed within a six month to nine month schedule which of course is not how quickly you build a Roman house. They wanted to build a house through Roman techniques and technologies, um, famously uh, not using wheelbarrows because wheelbarrows were, were, weren't used by Romans, they, they used baskets instead. Um, so um, there was this whole shtick that they would do it as the Romans did it, but they uh, compressed it into a modern um, timescale. As we'll see, it takes a lot longer to build a Roman building if you're going to do it properly. Um, but, you know, this was a television program. They're working to television schedules. They're working to uh, the, it, the the company that made the, the, the production. It was it was their call in effect. So the the, the cost of this is really quite considerable. Um, uh, as you can see, there's a huge quantity of materials needed, 30 tonnes of lime, 10 of ton and sto of stone and timber, the thousands of tiles which had to be imported from uh, ultimately from Spain. They, they abandoned attempts to make them. Shingles as well of, of oak uh, were required. And then the, the only thing that was actually made by the by the builders themselves were these mud bricks, which are made from clay and and um, animal dung, uh, cow dung, which is a traditional recipe and straw, uh, a traditional recipe. Now the stone you can see um, doesn't rise very high, except in the bathhouse. Um, this is the maximum height of the wall. It's, it's about a metre high, no, no higher than that. Uh, and then on top of that is a timber frame. Uh, and then the the, uh, the work was then finished in, in normal fashion. They've had to board the roof in order to take the weight of the tiles and the shingles. Um, and then they've finished the interiors of the house, N not entirely accurately, but accurately enough. I mean, this is a pretty good approximation of what a Romana British 
uh, decorative scheme would look like. And then the uh, in one room, they've done uh, a version to show different styles of decoration and different approaches to building. Unfortunately, these sort of more educational aspects were never interpreted properly. Uh, and it, it, it's a matter of regret that that, that really um, the full um, educational impact of this and the sort of full interpretive aspect of this was not was not fully developed uh, ever uh, and and still is, is a bit neglected on the site. The key interpretive lesson that I would draw from this uh, experiment, recre recreation if you like, uh, it, it is really about the wider city. Um, on the on the left here we've got a map of Roxeter based on the geophysical surveys and aerial photographic aerial photographic surveys and to a degree on excavation. So building six is this building here, um, which I hope you can see my arrow, um, but it's basically south of the Forum and across the road from the Bards. Um, the buildings in purple on that image are all the stone founded buildings that we can see. In other words, all the buildings like the one that's been recreated at Roxeter. There are about 130 of them. Uh, the green uh, structures are more likely to just be earth and clay and timber um, and, and therefore don't have as, as high a, or clear um, ge um, geophysical signal as the purple ones do. So um, the, the very basic lesson to take from it is just the sheer amount of material that you require to build a Roman city. We're just talking about 130 townhouses out of a total of more than double that plus all the public buildings. So you know, you're talking about huge quantities of stone, both lime and cut stone, and enormous quantities of timber and clay and all the rest of it, which went to build a Roman town. And uh, this sort of exercise has been carried out on fortresses, for example, but no one's really thought about how much it, uh, material you need to build a Roman town and then to maintain it. And it is a major, major cost. Uh, and this is just one way of getting that over to the public of saying, you know, here is a building. Now imagine 130 of these scattered around in landscape and then add in the other buildings that show up less clearly and then add in the public buildings and you get an idea of the size and scale of the city. So it's not without value. It's just a shame that those values are not communicated clearly and appropriate enough to the public who visit. Although clearly the building is extremely popular uh, and is one of the major attractions on the site even now. What I want to do is look at some comparative examples and the, 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 the example I, I often use when I look at Roxeter is, is that at Xanten in Germany. Uh, it's in the um, the Rhineland, uh, um, uh, and 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 therefore in in the Ruhr, it's in, it's it's in the same uh, county, if you like, as the as the Ruhr. And Zanten was built uh, and uh, recreated so that the population of the Ruhr, the industrial population of the Ruhr, could visit uh, a Roman site, uh, because normally, you know. Uh, uh, as you know, lots of German tourists go to places like Turkey uh, to go and see the remains there. But of course, the working class didn't have the funds to do that. So the, the council decided to build, or the lander decided to build or rebuild Roman, the Roman remains at Xanten in order for the working class to be able to ex have this Roman experience too. And the experiment still continues. They're still building, they're still uh, it, it, it gets about 250,000 visitors a year, perhaps more than that now, perhaps 400,000. It's between those two figures. So it is a major tourist attraction in the area. Um, the streets are marked out with, with avenues of trees. Um, the building up here on the top left is the reconstruction of the Roman baths, similar in size and scale to that at Roxeter, um, but re recreated here as a, as a as a steel and glass structure, um, in, so it's using modern materials. The building on the top right with the windmill behind it is the latest construction, and it is of townhouses. 
um, uh, exactly like the ones at Rockstar, uh, very similar in scale and shape and size and uh, date to, to those at Rockstar, but done in an entirely different way by the uh, resident architect who works at the site called Peter Kinsler. And I visited the site in 2008 when uh, Peter had starting his work, the, the plans had been made and they were starting to construct. And what they would did was to basically they'd excavated the site, they'd recovered the remains of buildings and they decided to build a strip frontage of three or four buildings and interpret them as shops and living, living lived in accommodation, um, uh, but using the most accurate methods that they could use. So they uh, the walls, as you can see, like as at Roxeter, instead of using stone, because this isn't a stone rich area, they're using brick, locally created brick, uh, pitched uh, at the foundation uh, to form a stable platform for the wall. The walls, however, are either timber framed with infill, like they are at Roxeter, or they use the, the much more common method both on the continent and, for that matter, in Roman Britain, which was rammed earth, pise, what the French call pise. So here you have a shattering, and you basically put earth in here, the, the brick earth uh, that occurs locally, and just pound it until it's solid. So what you get are, are, are this is this sort of effect of what looks like blocks of stone, but actually is just dried earth. Um, so you 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 make these um, uh, blocks of 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 pounded earth of compressed earth. You then have to let them set. They set for at least a year, usually two years, um, and then you plaster them. So this is what it looks like now. So we saw that it was constructed in 2008. Uh, it was finished roughly 2009. So it was, uh, you know, what you're looking at is results that have been standing there for 15, 16 years, and you can see the damage at the base, but basically these are perfectly sound buildings. Uh, here you can see the excavated remains in one of the houses, just to show what evidence base they're, they're using. And you can see the wall rising off these foundations and the decoration, uh, this is, a, 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 if I remember, it's a butcher's shop. Um, showing you the um, showing the interior of that with the shuttered facade and the uh, it's worth just going back to point out this wall is the same as this wall now and you can see uh, how it, it finishes it, it looks exactly as though it is a conventional roman stone built wall um, uh, very high quality um, but it's accurate it took years to do that's the point, is that if you're going to do it properly, you haven't got your camera breathing over your shoulder, then it, you know, it can be done, um, but it takes time. You can't hurry this sort of construction. And the Romans will have known that. And so it will have taken time. And that's another interpretive lesson to, to draw from such experiments, is that these things do not happen quickly, easily, uh, 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 or straightforwardly. You have to do a lot of research to get it right. Um, and just to conclude on a, on a sort of more colourful note, um, you, reconstructions are extremely expensive and difficult to reverse. And that's one of the reasons why for many, many years, English Heritage and, and the commensurates across the country and for that matter elsewhere, didn't really want to have reconstructions. They said that they uh, ruined the original what was left uh, and that they hindered the uh, understanding and that they offered false visions of the past uh, because how do you know whether what you're reconstructing is right or not and, and this is a nice compromise this was done to uh, open competition artists could write in with their ideas to celebrate 1900 years of Hadrian's Wall and this is the winning suggestion which was to recreate the north gates of Housestead's Roman Fort, one of the more prominent examples, owned actually by the National Trust, but presented largely by English Heritage. Um, and uh, this is a one-to-one -one reconstruction of the north gate, uh, but it's done in scaffolding and therefore temporary. It's presumably now been removed. It, it was removed at the, uh, it, the last day of exhibition was the 31st of October. 
and the artwork that covered it was done by a local community uh, in schools and 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 um, disabled and disadvantaged people who were led by the artist to create this uh, wonderful piece of of visionary work but what it does it does have an interpretive lesson it tells you how big and dominant and prominent these monuments were in its original form this gate would have been painted would have been lime washed it would have been white it would have been blindingly white you would have been able to see for miles around particularly on a day like when uh, on the day that i was fortunate enough to visit it was nice and sunny so you can imagine how these things dominate in the landscape and to me uh, and to die as well um, these monuments recreated in the landscape get over uh, to everyone how prominent these monuments were and and how important they were to the people who knew them when they were there uh, and that is something that that i think we'll always need to have we'll have to have we, we don't need to do this on every archaeological site but we do need to convey how important these sites were in their landscape at the time and this is just one way of doing it um, so thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, i look forward to any questions that you might have for relaxing times make it archaeodeath time